Payment for order flow is something that you may have heard of because one of the most popular retail brokerage firms of late, Robinhood, actually declared that it doesn't have brokerage fees. So if they don't, if a brokerage company doesn't have brokerage fees, how are they making money? Where is their revenue coming from? And of course the answer is payment for order flow. So the questions we're gonna be tackling here is, what is payment for order flow? How much can you make from it? Is there a difference between security types? Uh, what are the major firms that benefit? And um, is there any disbenefit to the retail trader? So let's get into that in the video. So let's explain what payment for order flow actually is. It's a simple transaction between a market making firm and a brokerage firm. Now, why would they pay? Well, essentially it's a payment to actually get orders, get the orders of retail traders to that particular market maker. Now, why would a market maker want order flow? What benefit is there in getting volume of transactions? Well, the market maker is trying to make the difference between the bid and the ask price. So a market maker is anyone that's willing to be bid at a certain price and also be on the other side and have an asking price on the screen. Now, the difference between these two prices in the marketplace, the price that you can buy and the price that you can sell, is called the bid ask spread. Now, the more liquid a particular asset is, the smaller that bid ask spread is. So for the example here, we have a lot of the stocks on the S&P 500 have very small spreads. Now in comparison, some of the derivative markets, so the options on those very underlines, have larger spreads. Now regulators do have strict rules on how far this spread can be given the timelines of some derivatives. For example, here in the, um, on the ASX, you can see here that there's been a fundamental change on different timelines just recently since uh, October the 1st this year that market makers have to have liquidity. So this is really essential to understand that there are limits in this bid ask spread. Now, how can a market maker make money from this bid ask spread? Well, essentially, as they fill orders, they're trying to capture as much of that bid ask spread as possible. So. They love retail traders because they're often um, transacting in smaller volumes and therefore are happy to carry the risk on certain directions. It's very easy for them to capture as much of that bid ask spread as possible. So if they're benefiting by netting off the risk between the buys and sells that retail um, investors make throughout the day, then the aim of the game in making that bid ask spread is volume. So how do you get that volume? Well, one way here is obviously paying brokers where all the retail investors are trying to submit orders to, paying the brokers money for that order flow, for the flow of orders from those retail traders um, and getting their executions. In executing their price, the market maker is taking on quite a lot of risk depending on the product. They're taking on directional risk um, in whichever way it comes and it's constantly changing. So for that risk, they are being compensated the bid ask spread, and really it comes down to the fee structure and the arrangements that these exchanges have with market makers. So it's important to understand that a market maker has special arrangements with exchanges to actually execute these orders in the end. Now, for example, the New York Stock Exchange has a uh, maker taker framework. So this economic model is where if you add to the liquidity, so um, non-marketable orders that aren't going to be executed, but add to the liquidity of that order book, then you're paid for that service. If on the other hand, you transact and it's a marketable order, then you're taking away liquidity from the order book. So you have to pay a fee for that. So the difference between that fee structure uh, the payments and fees from the market exchange is how the market exchange makes money. So obviously what uh, the market maker is trying to do is limit the amount that it actually pays the exchange and they're trying to maximize the amount of volume that they have um, on that bid ask spread and therefore earning as much money as possible. Now, who gets that order flow and who doesn't? So now that we've established that market makers like increased volume because the more volume that they have, the more executions that they have, and then overall that's leading to a larger volume net profit in terms of that bid ask spread. So what does that mean? How do they actually get the order flow? Well, essentially on 
A lot of the brokers' websites, they have to state a number of times that all market makers are paid equally. So what I mean by that is that for a certain order type, for a certain order size, um, each broker, you know, no matter who they are, are going to be paid the same amount. So how come you can see in some of the brokers that more money funnels to different market making firms? Well, that's the competitive advantage that some market making firms have. For example, Citadel is one of the largest market makers in terms of some of the US uh, retail brokerage firms. And you can see that in the chart here. This is done on a bit of a bidding process internally. So the bid ask spread that you can actually see on an exchange is really the upper limit. If, however, certain market makers have a lot of order flow, they can start price competing against other market makers. So really the person with the most amount of volume, the most amount of visibility in the marketplace is really the winner because they can reduce that bid ask spread and earn smaller margins but then transact more often. So really these firms are quite incentivized to get you the best price possible because then they win more volume. So you, you'll often see on websites of brokerage firms like Robinhood here that there is some kind of net improvement in transactions. So this is compared to if you were just transacting with the exchange at that bid ask spread, what is the net improvement over a number of transactions? So here Robinhood are boasting that they've got a $1.72 um, per 100 share improvement on that uh, market price compared to what it would be if you just you know, transacted at the exchange bid ask spreads. So there is a net benefit to retail traders. Now, where is the disbenefit coming from and where is the, some of the conflicts of interest? So in the Wall Street Journal recently, there was an article about how Robinhood's cashing in on trading options on its website. So this really highlighted, okay, I'm going to go see how available this information is. Now, thanks to the SEC for their rule 605 and 606, companies and brokerage firms actually need to declare and report some of the statistics around payment for order flow. In 2005, the SEC actually added a rule that in actually increased the um, visibility of what these brokerage sites were doing and being paid in terms of payment for order flow. Now, this has made it a lot more visible, transparent, and we can see exactly for what different order types and which institutions are paying for these order flows. So I've got a list of market makers here and we're going to compare it to the Wall Street Journal. So the Wall Street Journal actually quotes Bloomberg here as the data source. And you can see here that payment for order flow over the largest 11 brokerage firms can show that payment for order flow for options is a lot higher than net payments than stocks. So we're gonna be taking a deep dive into the SEC's mandated 606 reports that actually disclose uh, the payment for order flows for the top four brokerage, brokering firms in the US. Now we are gonna compare this to the Q321 uh, Robinhood payment for order flow net payments. So let's jump in and take a look at this. So I've jumped in here to the computer because I've gone through the 605 reports for the four largest brokerage firms in the US and I've broken it down by a couple of categories. So for Q2 2021, you can see buy security type and they're listed here as S&P 500 stocks, non S&P 500 stocks and options contracts. The different percentages here that actually makes up the net payment flows from market makers to the brokerage firms. Now you can see obviously that options contracts has a net payment of approximately 60%. So that's a large piece of the pie compared to the non S&P 500 stocks, 34% and a small slice for the S&P 500. Now by moving to by broker, so we can see here that the four brokerage firms here on the left hand side indicated by the color, by far the largest payments, net payments, was to TD Ameritrade Clearing, 47%. Now that's a very large piece of the pie in terms of payments. Now we are going to see that those payments are very, very close to what the Q321 payments were for Robinhood. So in terms of actually payment for order flow, 
this is going to be a very large business for Robinhood going, going forward because really they're already on par with TD Ameritrade. So Charles Schwab is actually a, a smaller piece of the pie at 16%, E-Trade 27% and Fidelity Brokerage Services 10%. Now Fidelity, this is definitely not their core business. Um, so it's, it's important to note that uh, payment for order flow is not something that they're doing a lot of. However, it is something they're benefiting from for options primarily. So if we actually consider buy order type now, what are the net payments in terms of order type? Well, the order types that are categorized in the reporting are market orders. So market orders is where you tick, I wanna transact at the market order and it will go through immediately. That takes liquidity away from the marketplace and the order book. The marketable limit orders are ones that are actually within the bid ask spread in the, in the correct direction, whether you're buying or selling. So they can actually be marketed by the, and executed by the market maker nearly immediately. So what is a non-marketable limit order? Well, again, a limit order is just um, something that you've actually put a price to. I wanna execute at $23.50. Um, so once you've listed that price, if you're buying, for example, then if that $23.50 is below the ask pr price in the marketplace, then that's a non-marketable limit order because the market maker is not willing to transact on that order. However, um, and it's the same thing for a sell. If it's above the bid price, um, then it's a non-marketable order. Now, this is actually a good thing for a market maker. Why? Because oftentimes exchanges incentivize market makers for um, increasing liquidity to the order book. So it's very important to actually remember that um, many exchanges incentivize increased liquidity. So by that, I mean by increasing the depth of the order book. So if we have non-marketable limit orders, the depth of the order book and therefore the flexibility and the optionality of the market makers in terms of where they can go next is actually quite large. So this is actually a preferred market order and therefore they actually request a higher market price for these orders. So you'll see that in a second. And that is why there haven't necessarily been a larger number of orders, but there have been higher prices in terms of net payment for order flow. That is why the non-marketable limit orders have 37% of this pie. Other market orders, 12%, the smallest. So here we have a bar chart of the market makers. So you'll see ones that you recognize there, Seguestrahana, Citadel Execution, um, Dash, G1, Jane Street, Morgan Stanley, the NASDAQ, um, the, the New York Stock Exchange, obviously, UBS, Wolverine, and Virtue Americas. So these are the largest firms that actually provide market making services and are willing to be able to pay these large brokerage firms for um, order flow. So as you can see here, by net payment, Citadel is by far one of the largest and most active across all these securities. So it is very interesting to see that. Obviously in the options contracts, they're the largest bars here. And again, that's not necessarily because of transaction volume, although there is a high demand in the US for options, but more so there's actually a higher price that market makers are willing to pay for options. So this is what one of those base statements look like. And you can see it's a pretty boring document. We've got the S&P 500 stocks here by the different venues that uh, the market makers that are paying for these transactions. We've got all the different net payments and then the net payments per 100 shares that are transacted. And you can see here that those are often um, cents per 100 shares. So if we look at the stocks, for example, here, we can see that Citadel, um, has received a net payment of 33 cents per 100 shares for uh, market orders. Now, the reason that these vary is that they are offered to all market makers the exact same. Um, the brokerage firms uh, charge the same price for the same order type and the same volume. But different volumes, obviously, with different price packets uh, that are marketed to these venues, 
Um, well, these market makers will have different varying levels. Uh, they will transact a different amount of different order types and therefore you get the difference in prices. That has had to be stated so many times in these material aspects clauses uh, for full disclosure. So it's, it's incredible to see how, that that's had to be written on each and every one of these pages in, on each venue. We can see here for Citadel, the net payment for non S&P 500 stocks for Citadel Securities um, has been to about 25 and a half cents per 100 shares transacted. Now let's compare that to the options price. It's nearly double. So Citadel Securities is receiving for uh, limit order types, marketable limit order types, 56 cents. Now, this is an incredible difference. And obviously the difference here is that the market maker is very incentivized to be um, trading and market making in options because again, the bid ask spreads are a lot larger. So these markets are often more illiquid, the order book is thinner and the, um, the actual limits uh, posed by the exchange are much larger on these products. What does that mean? Well, that means more margins for uh, these, these market makers and therefore they're incentivized to actually get more order flow, pay a higher amount for order flow um, for those markets. Now the conflict of interest that actually presents is that then if a lot of the revenue is actually coming from payment for order flow in terms of what the broker's receiving for options compared to stocks, what do you think that the uh, broker on the website, on the apps, on all the media campaigns are going to be targeting you in terms of marketing their products. Is it gonna be buy stocks in Australia, non S&P 500 stocks? I don't think so. So this is where the conflict of interest comes and it's in this higher payment for order flow of options compared to stocks. So is the broker pushing that in front of you in terms of marketing and is that in an unethical way? That's a question that I'll leave for you guys in the, in the comment section below. Love to hear your thoughts on it. So just moving back over into our spreadsheet, I wanna bring up TD Ameritrade, and this is where I need you, the audience's help, because I don't know where to find this information. As you can see here, from Q1 20 to Q2 21, we've had this steady and, and large increase across all these market making firms um, for payment for order flow. Now that's a net increase. Now, what I would really like to know, because I've already been I've already been through and haven't noticed a noticeable increase in the actual payment for order flow per hundred shares for all these different products. So I'd like to know where can I find the demand figures in the US for TD Ameritrade. I would like to know how many accounts were open and the active accounts that were actually used during that period of time. And I would like to know the average number of transactions per client. That would all be really useful information. I have no idea where to get that from as an Australian citizen. So anyone who knows where I can find that type of information would love for you to put that in the comment section below. So not everyone's declared their 606 reports yet, but Robinhood has for its Q3. And you can see here that the net payment flow for options contracts is absolutely ridiculous. What is that? That is, 160 million for uh, the options contracts, which is just mind bottling that that's larger than the Q2 or Q1 options payment for order flow by TD Ameritrade, one of the largest brokerage firms in the world. So if we look to the Robin Hood uh, second quarterly um, 2021 results, we can actually see here that the difference between their active users between 2021 and 2020 um, Q2 was absolutely ridiculous. We're looking at a 10 million uh, users in the second quarter of 2020 compared to 21.3 million users in the second quarter of 2021. So that's a 109% increase in monthly active users. So obviously there's been huge demand for retailers over the last year going onto the platform and appetite for risk taking with options by the looks of it on the Robinhood platform. So again, I think everyone's incentivized because it's very easy to say that this is not, there's no brokerage costs, come to our platform, that's our competitive advantage. But it's important to remember that uh, Robinhood actually has a value to your services and, and you wanting to buy and sell 
um, stocks and, and products, it's in payment for order flow. Now, these numbers are consistent with the Wall Street Journal that you can see here for the transaction revenues um, for options, stocks, and cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency is not something that needs to be declared in that 606 report. Um, but it will be interesting to see that if market makers get into this space, then they might be requesting, or they might be requesting that they get order flow for those services as well in the future. Now, really cool to see the net interest revenue. Remember that if you have just money sitting in your account with any brokerage firm, there's going to be disc, uh, a clause in there that says. Um, that they can use that money to actually earn interest on. And obviously that's a considerable amount of their revenue as well. So as we saw in TD Ameritrade's uh, increase in net revenue over, over the years for payment for order flow, we can actually bring this down for demand of, um, of products on the exchange. So here we've got the Options Clearing Corp as a source and we can see over time here the increase in average daily options volume over the last couple of years. Now there's obviously been a massive increase in risk appetite for options and this could potentially obviously a lot of volumes coming from institutional traders but now with brokerage firms incentivizing retail traders to come on their platform with no brokerage fees and then uh, obviously there's it's hard to get leverage for buying stocks through traditional um, banks and services so the leverage that you get by trading options in America is obviously something um, that is desirable from a retail trader in terms of risk appetite so obviously that has added to the demand here over the last two years so I encourage you all to um, think a little bit deeper and actually dive into the 606 reports and work out um, the incentives of different brokerage firms for yourself so hopefully you learned a lot about payment for order flow today. Hopefully you learned that um, increased trading demand has actually led to uh, market makers paying retail brokerage firms for orders. They wanna do this so they can maximize their profits um, while having to hedge out that risk. And I mean, the brokerage firms love it because this is a form of payment that they can receive, a, a form of revenue where they're not incentivized by having to place uh, large transaction fees. So they actually win customers by saying there's no fees, no transaction fees, no brokerage on our platform, come here and transact with us, where in fact that actual orders and um, executions and the orders placed from retail traders like us actually has a lot of value to the brokerage firm. So it's important to remember that. So apologies to everyone for taking a couple of weeks off. I um, came off my bike, I'm an avid cyclist, and I broke my elbow. So I did take a couple of weeks off uh, the YouTube for that, but I'm back at it and going to be talking about all things quantitative finance, market making, and getting into some of risk neutral pricing and options theory. So stay tuned for that, and if you wanna see those videos, please hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell for the next video. Until next time, YouTube, see you later.